Today on the HR Congress podcast, we'll be talking to Jochen Müller of UPS. We'll be discussing learning and talent in the age of digital, AI, and agility. So good afternoon and welcome to the HR Congress podcast today. My name is Ben Churchhouse and I'm joined again by Jochen Müller of UPS. Full disclosure, we managed to lose the recording of the previous podcast we recorded last week, which was a little bit of a disaster, but Jochen was generous enough to join me again on the podcast today and we're going to give this one another shot. So thank you, Jochen, first of all, for last week and of course for joining me again this week. Sure. You're very welcome, Ben. So, yeah, I'd just like to introduce you. I'll give you a quick introduction again. So Jochen's currently the Vice President of HR and Labor Relations Europe at UPS. He's gained experience working in the logistics and supply chain industry in Europe and specializes in employee benefits and compensation, change management, HR transformation, and organizational culture, as well as a lot of other things. So Jochen will be joining us at the Digital HR Innovation Summit in The Hague this April, coming up in about two months' time. And he's going to be presenting a session in the learning and talent innovation track, learning and talent in the age of digital AI and agility. So before we get into the main questions, and I know you've already given me this introduction last week, but can you please tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your current work? Yeah, of course, Ben. I guess uh, most of you will be familiar with UPS on the logistics side especially on the small package side. And this is uh, most of what I'm going to refer to uh, during uh, our conversation now and also during the presentation, um, actually at the conference. Uh, Here in Europe, UPS employs about 50,000 employees, more or less every single country in Europe, uh, which for HR means we need to cover 16 languages. Uh, We have about uh, 200 benefit plans, 100 pension plans. Uh, We deal with uh, 42 unions right now. And uh, that's quite an interesting arena that we have to cover. I'm part of the executive board for our Europe region here. Uh, So really with our president and the other vice presidents uh, taking decisions on the strategy, uh, how we want to go forward. I have already been for 30 years with UPS and millennials might say, how can that be? But actually, this is my 16th role. And I had the great opportunity to move from country to country. I've lived uh, in Germany, obviously, where I'm from originally. France, UK, Belgium, three times already. So for the last 25 years, I have more or less traveled across Europe, which made it also interesting because it gives you a a different dimension of national culture, languages, and uh, diverse and inclusive environments. In addition to being the VP for HR and Labor, I'm also director of our employee risk benefits captive and a board member of United Way in Germany. From the most pressing pressing issues that we are currently working on in UPS, also globally, is we have already seen our industry changing. And while we are doing very well from a business perspective, we thought it is the right time to prepare for the future. So Like many other companies, we are undergoing organizational transformation. Um, And at the same time that we do that, changing processes, changing our setups, merging countries and and things like this, we are also going through an HR transformation where we do more or less the same, but even to a larger extent. So it's a process redesign, new technology implementation, and also structural changes uh, that include outsourcing, offshoring, and, and things like this. So a couple of exciting years also ahead of us. Yeah, it's one of the most fascinating areas of modern HR and the innovation world, especially when we talk about logistics and what you're doing within the the packaging and parcel delivery side of the business. Can you please quickly explain some of the the changes that this industry, in particular what you're working with at UPS, some of the changes that you're going through and how this is impacting your work specifically within HR? Oh, yes, absolutely. The, the interesting piece is UPS is this year will turn 114 years. And we have for the vast majority of time always done exactly the same, delivering those packages, picking them up, transporting, delivering them. So it's a global network that really runs like a clock. And that requires compliance, 
uh, adhering to processes, local operating processes, standard operating processes, and so on. And the barriers of entry into our industry were extremely high because you needed all these vehicles and airplanes and buildings around the world and so on. But in the last decade, a little more, that has changed significantly. E-commerce is booming more and more. So before we were really focused on B2B, now it's more B2C. Everyone is ordering on Amazon and, and other platforms. People want to packages delivered at home. So there is significantly less density and there is significantly more competitors all of a sudden because you can play in a very small area but in the same industry. So Uber, for example, can also transport packages you know, from A to B within a city. Amazon is already doing that. Amazon has not been a competitor for us before. It's actually our largest customers, that big that we have disclosed, to disclose it uh, on our quarterly calls. So customer becomes a competitor, huge change. Uh, B2C increase, huge change. Sustainability measures, might prevent us from access to city centers in the future, especially with diesel vehicles and so on. So we, we are heavily trying to uh, change our fleet into electric cars. We just ordered 10,000 in the UK, but all of this takes some time and there are also technical issues to get enough juice into our buildings and things like this. But then there are technologies developed right now that we already know will significantly change the industry. 5G, uh, Internet of Things, blockchain, machine learning, and so on. That has partially already changed the visibility, for example, allowing customers to immediate intervention, changing shipments on the fly from your package here right now. Yes, but I want to deliver it there you know, in the next hour. That is already possible, but there is so much more coming um, allowing for the specifically the visibility and the opportunity to track packages when you think about vaccines that are shipped, track that they stay within a certain range of temperature, humidity, and things like this. That's part of huge changes, but I know that there is so much more coming. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of staggering the amount of uh, business change that's been happening in this one particular area with the advent of not only the internet, but just the, the sheer number of competitors and competitive ways that packages can be delivered and tracked and traced and the specific types of technology that's now used, for example, in internet of things and you know, having touch points across the whole delivery cycle must be staggering. And I know you go into a lot of business depth trying to you know, think of the strategies and think of the ways to, to turn this to your advantage. But one of the things that's always fascinating for, for me is, is how these changes are impacting your employees at the organization. So what are some of the ways that these general changes are really impacting how you yeah. approach employee relations and of course how the employees work? I think we are right now in the phase that we need to prepare our employees for even more changes. If you, if you think about what we are already testing and our employees are seeing this, we are testing autonomous driving. In the US, we have a test where an autonomous vehicle is going from one of the UPS shops to one of our centers, forth and back all day to transport packages. So that is coming. In the UK, we are testing a, a shifter. So within our big hubs, an autonomous vehicle that is actually moving containers from door to door to be unloaded and to be loaded again at different doors. All of this is already in place. Uh, robotics will be able to change manual handling. I've already seen that in China. Right now, there, is, there are still some hiccups. You know, if all boxes would be exactly the same shape, it would work perfectly. But you know, that's not the reality we are working in. We have also already started our first fully licensed drone airline. So in October, we had the first flight with government approval out of sight, which was always the big deal. So no one is actually monitoring the, the drone while it's flying, and it is um, distributing pharmaceuticals for CVS pharmacies. So that is a commercial product already. For all of these, the business cases need to be right, obviously, 
before they can be implemented, but our people see that. And if, you know, like payback period, the quality, the speed, and so on get right, they will be replacing a lot of positions. When you just think about our transport network and the trucks, feeder trucks that go between the buildings, already today we could use platooning, where only the first one is really meant and all the others are just following. That reduces the number of people. And we have, we are looking at how this is impacting our company on the long term. Because many of those employees could be redundant. And we know that we can help some of them by upskilling, reskilling, and so on. But we also know that we might have to prepare our people for positions outside of the company. And we are also looking into doing that. On the other hand, we are creating an environment where new jobs will be created for robotics, for automation. We need engineers, we need technicians, and so on, that are very hard to find. And completely new jobs will be created that don't even exist today. So the drone pilot, for example, is not really a job today. And the company Einride, for example, in Sweden has... Um, developed a truck that doesn't even have, have a, a cabin anymore for a driver. So everything is remote. Eventually, with machine learning, the, the truck will learn if there is an obstacle and if the, if the truck has to drive around and stuff. But there is always someone in a back office that needs to, needs to support this truck. But eventually, they think that one remote truck driver can manage about 10 different vehicles at the same time. So new jobs will be created that don't exist today. And I'm sure there will be many more to come that we don't know about yet. Yeah, indeed. And this for me is an intensely fascinating subject because I could probably talk on and on and on about some of the maybe social or economic implications on maybe a global or you know, international level for this. And I know you've, you've touched on the point there about how the organization is planning to prepare the support empl employees through these changes the best you can. So what are some of the most important things to consider when you're developing a learning strategy for something like this, for some kind of economic reality that we're facing at the moment and in the next you know, five to 10 foreseeable years? I think I'm, I'm, I might go back a little bit and talk about this additional support also that we think we will need to give our employees. I mean, upskilling, reskilling, we already talked about. We have currently a um, university program in-house. It's a work-based degree that, that employees can do. We have about 120 that are working on, on it right now, but it's management and leadership. And we are looking for corporations with uh, universities that can provide us education and engineering and technical degrees. And that is what we want to provide our employees as well in order to provide them the skills that they need in the future. The other thing is that we also, we don't want to create things and create structures for the future without involving our employees because they should be part of these changes. They, will, they are also our customers out there. You know, they are our advocates uh, in, in the uh, societies we are working in and so on. So we want to take our employees with us throughout this change. But I think the most important thing for us, and we are far from being there, is to create this culture uh, of a learning organization. When you, when you think about the learning strategy, I, I'm always using, I'm sitting here very close to my IT partner, and I, I'm thinking about the changes that IT has gone through over the last 30 years with just programmers needed to learn new languages. Like, you know, even Python, heavily used, but there are so many new ones like Julia, Kotlin, Swift, Rust that, you know, people have never heard before. And that will eventually be the, the main program languages. They need to learn and unlearn all the time. And how can we get the same spirit into other functions? I was at uh, just yesterday, and so it's good that we have the second conversation here. I was at our annual meeting of the European Works Council, and there, there was a discussion with me about the non-op positions. So all these administrative positions that work in support functions. 
And the question was, can we give them kind of a job guarantee and so on? And even one of the members stepped in and said, hey, guys, just think about it. We are in 2020 and technology is so fast. All the jobs will change and you cannot expect guarantees anymore, but people need to make sure that you know, they stay current with the skills that are needed and probably even look ahead and see what will be needed tomorrow because what is sufficient today might not be sufficient tomorrow. And we as a company need to guide them, help them and support them as much as we can. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, organizations do have some, uh, especially larger organizations do have some responsibility to at least give um, employees a push in, in the right direction to, to upskill and reskill and potentially uh, you know, overqualify themselves for the future. I do think it's kind of unrealistic to expect large percentages of the population to all of a sudden become uh, programmers and uh, engineers and, and whatnot, of course. But uh, there are plenty of opportunities there and, and people do need to take responsibility and figure that out themselves. But yeah, there does need to be some playback between employees, organizations, and, and maybe local government, regional government, et cetera, for, for certain positions, especially in you know, engineering, manufacturing, STEM. I, I, I mean, I also think that the cooperation with, not only with the employees, but also with the unions, with the legislator as well, in, in order with universities, in order to create the education that is needed for tomorrow and not only for as you said for the engineers but you know the, the technical level the people that you know can maintain those robots don't necessarily have to be engineers but you know they need to have certain skills and and these jobs also need an, a formal educational background and if they don't exist today you know we need to work as companies together with the legislator in order to make sure they exist tomorrow so that our kids can actually go through this education. You know, if you are a parent, you might today when you tell your children, you know, go and play some video games, it might be a great advice for their future. <laughs> that could be very true. And I think I mentioned last time, but I sort of wish I'd uh, actually done something akin to engineering or computer science or something at university. Nonetheless, I didn't. And that's why I'm a podcast host and not a robotic engineer. What would be your advice to HR people in similar situations, i.e. those facing significant technological changes that impact the way the employees work and the business operates? What would your advice be to them? First of all, you have to be extremely curious and read a lot and discuss a lot with people of how the, the future for your industry or in general society uh, and economy is going to look like. What are your expectations? because that might shape significantly how you need to prepare. So this entire, my, my entire look at autonomous driving and going to companies that do robotics that are customers of us and so on is self-driven. I'm really interested in that because I want to know what I need to do in order to create the future for this company as well. So you need to be very curious and you know, think ahead of everyone else to see what does the future bring. And then, I think every company needs to have a very clear strategy that the employees understand and obviously all the other stakeholders understand so that it really sticks with everyone and it needs to be kind of the North Star for everyone because you will go through significant change and change is always tough and the people need to believe in you and believe that the direction you are going is the right way and the, and the path that you are taking is also the right path. So being transparent, looking at uh, long-term needs for the business, but also for employment skills, competencies, and so on. I still don't think that any robot or any machine in the future will be able to show empathy and will really replace humans. So I think humans and leaders will still be needed, and we need to prepare our workforce for that as well. And then I think I mentioned already, you know, the cooperation with schools, university, the legislator, the unions, and so on is extremely important because none of us will be able to do it on our own. And we need to all have a common understanding of how to prepare and share ideas, collaborate, innovate together. Yeah, I just wanted to touch quickly back on the point of, of transparency. 
and authenticity to a certain degree because I think those are two very important parts of the conversation. And I, I think as long as that there is that implicit trust between employees, the workforce, the organizations and the private sector, that it will go a long way into waylaying some of those fears that people have. Because of course, it is a tricky subject. People are going to disagree on, on how to tackle things, it's going to be things, uh, challenges to, to overcome. But I think that's probably the most fundamental step. And then all of the other things, you know, the developing different learning strategies, cooperation between universities and, and, and the governments and organizations and the public. And then the rest of it is, you know, down to sort of the free market to a certain degree. I think that a lot of, a lot of technology will be developed. The, there is then in, always for a company, there is a certain decision point when it turns from not being reasonable to implement something to really becoming necessary. Just because of, you know, your return on investment that you're going to have. And how fast technology develops because you, you buy something today it could be outdated tomorrow and i think these business cases of does it really provide me with the quality the speed the the flexibility that i need and i'm gonna during my presentation actually i'm gonna have an example of such a technology that provides even more flexibility than what we have today which is fantastic for us but it costs a lot of money so what countries do you start with? Probably the high cost countries, you know, that we are all living in right now here in Western Europe. And then it only spills over into the other countries and the business case gets weaker and weaker. So it's a fascinating area to look at. And obviously there are futurists that also, you know, predict how fast certain technologies will be rolled out, but they have, uh, they have also failed a lot of times. Yeah, I know that's a contentious area within some contemporary debates about how fast these uh, changes are going to happen, but I'm completely clueless as to the, <laughs> the actual reality of, of who's correct. So I'm probably going to stay out of that debate. Um, so you've, you've touched on it quickly, but could you please explain a little more about what you're going to be delivering during your session and what the attendees can, can hear more from you about in The Hague? I think I will. Obviously, I think the... The change in our industry is, is very significant, will be very significant for the future. Five years, 10 years out, maybe up to 20 years. But I think in 20 years, we'll, we'll see a very different the logistics business. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what is going to change. And then I will refer back to what is the impact of our workforce and how we are preparing this workforce for the future, which obviously is, you know, the ideas that we have, the discussions that we have, um, not sure if it comes exactly that way. Obviously, change is, is always uh, very volatile as well, so we will see. But in addition, I will look a, a little bit, and I know it's not really the topic for all the HR people, but it's at least a topic for me because I think those changes have a significant impact on our society. And we also, as citizens, need to define and to co-decide how we want to handle those changes. If it hits our industry, it might hit a lot of industries and that might change the, the shape of the workforce significantly for entire countries or entire regions and continents. So how can people get in contact with you if they wish to learn more about you or what you're doing at the moment in UPS? Yeah, I mean, at the conference, always happy to uh, have a cup of coffee with someone and chat or uh, a drink in the evening. Um, but obviously, you can also contact me uh, on LinkedIn, Jochen Müller, comma, MBA. And I think there is only one Jochen Müller, probably like that. And my email address is jochenmüller at ups.com, no dot. So just my name at ups.com. Mm -hmm.